In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is there a difference between a, a, a smart man and a wise man? I say that not to start an argument or, or to be a smart aleck, but I wonder on this Sunday, the first Sunday of a brand new year, when we're talking about wise men, and we see wise men who are seeking Jesus, what, well, what exactly, how, how do wise people seek Jesus in 2016? And is there a difference between worldly smarts and real wisdom? In order to find out, we're going to be taking a look at a variety of characters that are found in Matthew chapter 2. Different characters, and maybe they can help tell us what's the difference between maybe perhaps sinful smarts and spiritual wisdom. So return with me to Matthew chapter 2, the gospel lesson for today. The first one we're going to take a look at is King Herod. I would say that King Herod was... A smart man. He was shrewd as a snake and he was brutal beyond belief. Herod, Herod was very smart. He knew how the world works. And so when it came down to taking care of people, he did it the good old fashioned way. Either he would buy them off or he would butcher them. And so when the religious leaders of Jerusalem, they opposed his kingship over Judea, what does Herod do? He buys them off and he builds them a brand new temple that they can worship God in. But then when the noble families of Palestine opposed his kingship, he butchered 42 of the leading families. He butchered them. Oh, then the chief opponent against Herod, his name was Aristobulus. And so how does Herod deal with him? Well, he invites Aristobulus to a swimming pool party down in the Jordan River. And then he buys off Aristobulus' bodyguards to have Aristobulus drowned. But then Herod, after his death, throws him the, the most magnificent funeral, and he makes sure that he pays for it all. He either buys them off or he butchers them. See, Herod was one sharp, smart cookie. Then we get to Matthew chapter 2. And now something changes. We see a, a response, a reaction from Herod that... Well, you, you, you'll see why. It, it, there's a threat to him. There's, there's a threat to him, but it has nothing to do with his finances, has nothing to do uh, with his family, but has everything to do with the baby and has everything to do with power and authority. Listen, um, there were wise men that came to Jerusalem and they asked, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? And now look at Herod's reaction in verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Have you ever heard the word disturbed before? And have you ever gotten so stirred up when you heard news that all of a sudden things were just fine? Everything, everything was all calm. And then all of a sudden you got news that just rattled your, your world. And all of a sudden the calmness and the peace that you felt in your heart, it was replaced like with that pit in your stomach. And all of a sudden, you who were so objective and clearing and thinking so clearly, all of a sudden, you didn't know what to think. You were so uncertain. You didn't trust yourself. What are you going to do? That's Herod. He got news that so rattled and shook his world to the core that now his immediate reaction is followed up with this response. And I ask you, do you think it is a smart response or a wise response? So, then Herod called, I'm at verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. 
He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you have found him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, is that smart? Or is that wise? And Herod is living true to form. And for what would most benefit him, this is smart. And you think about that. Herod, what is Herod's intent in really knowing what is the home address? What's the GPS location of this newborn king? And, and, and we're told why. And it's not recorded in, in your text for this morning, but I'll tell you why. Because later we're told in Matthew 2, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. See, Herod used his smarts for a covert operation. He disguised his, his inward intentions and he even fooled these wise men. Herod proves how you can be worldly smart. You can manipulate people in order to get what you want. And it's all hypocrisy. Herod was smart. But he was spiritually stupid. Eternally stupid. And so I looked up the word stupid in a book on my shelf. And it's, it said this. Stupid people are never lonely. So we move on to our next set of characters in Matthew chapter 2. They are the teachers of the law. Um, they're in Jerusalem with Herod when the Magi come looking for uh, this newborn king. They are very well educated priests, mind you. Uh, they're the spiritual leaders of God's people. And so uh, how would you equate them today? I would say that they are the kind of people who who know their, their Bibles backwards and forwards. They know all of the scripture passages. They go to church on a regular basis. Know any, any of uh, people who are like that? Now listen, when um, they're asked, where is the Messiah born? They know immediately where to go to. And they sit, so they tell King Herod, why, that's in Bethlehem in Judea. This is what the prophet has written. I'm on verse 6, by the way. Bethlehem, you Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Out of you will come for me a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. See, they were smart enough to know the exact location of where this coming Messiah is going to be found, and they can go back hundreds of years to an Old Testament prophecy. But they're not smart enough to saddle a donkey and travel the couple miles and, and see this newborn king and worship him. See, they're smart. They're even biblically smart. They can recite Bible passages. They can sing hymn verses in parts. They were born and bred in the faith. And it made them spiritually lazy. Apathetic. I, I ask you, is there a difference between, be, between being smart and being a wise person. You can know all the scriptures facts. You can know all about the Bible. You can sit here Sunday after Sunday. And yet inwardly. If you, if you find your relationship with Christ. To be apathetic. Lukewarm. Indifferent. If you're just going through the motions. Then how are you any different than the teachers of the law. Who did not know Christ. And didn't care of their salvation. See I see the same difference today. Right? Every time I go through a Bible information class and I, and I get a group of people, you could see the difference between a person who is just, they're understanding, they're getting, for the, they're getting it for the very first time. They're understanding God's plan for them, and it's almost as if the scales are lifting off their eyes. They are thrilled by it. And the difference of someone who's just simply going through the motions. Why is it? That someone here can drive from an hour away to church. And yet there are others who groan at the thought of, oh, do I have to go to church? And the covers get pulled a little tighter right about now. How is it that we can embrace and know all the facts about our faith? Like the teachers of the law. We go through our confirmation, we memorize it, and yet has that changed the condition of our hearts? 
Have you thought about where your heart is as you enter the new year of 2016? Do, do your hearts jump at the thought of a weekend at Disney? Or maybe an afternoon of watching football? The thought of being able to go to the beach and enjoy it? Do, do your hearts, are, are, your, are your minds and your hearts already going and saying, hey, um, I wonder what's going to be uh, on for a morning breakfast buffet after we get out of here? Do we think through and we plan through all of that? Do, do, you, do you start saying to yourself, you know, well, how about that weather outside? Hey, it, boy, it really turned cold this morning, right? But what about, the, what about the, the condition and the temperature of your heart? When was the last time a cold shiver went down your spine at the thought of, your, of lukewarmness in your relationship to, to Christ? Is there a difference between being a smart person and being a wise person? And if so, what's going to change on this first Sunday of a brand new year? What's going to change you from being smart to being wise? Now we come to our third group of characters found in Matthew chapter 2. And it's interesting how they are described. They're called the Magi uh, from the East. We don't know too much about them, a lot, a lot of what we know, uh, we, we, we think and we believe based upon how artists have portrayed them on Christmas cards. But here's what we do know uh, about them. Uh, we know uh, magi, that, that's the Greek word, it refers to um, a, a wise uh, person. Uh, these, were, the, these were wise men. Uh, it's where we get our word for magic, magician. It's a synonymous with uh, sorcery because uh, these wise men, um, they studied carefully uh, two disciplines. One was um, astronomy, which is a science of the stars, and the other one is astrology, which is uh, the superstition that's associated with the stars. And so they were blended together. But this was very much uh, a very powerful, influential uh, group. They were known to have effect on who the next king would be. So these wise men were oftentimes in ancient, in ancient times, they were called the king makers. So these are the magi. And the other thing that we know is that they are from the east as opposed to from the empires uh, of the west, which were the Greek and the Romans. They were from an ancient line of empires uh, that dated all the way back to Babylonian times. And we're told that hundreds of years before, uh, the king of Babylon, his name was Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he took into captivity the nation of Judah. And there was one particular Jew. His name was Daniel. He was smart and wise. He was so smart to the world that he would influence an entire line of kings, but at the same time, he was wise and he never wavered or changed in his faith. And so, consequently, Daniel became one of the highest ranking officials in an empire in the East. He became the leader of all the wise men. And so, here we are hundreds of years later, and you can see the influence of a Jew from hundreds of years before whose faith was in God as he's sharing wisdom. But it's not worldly smarts, it's the wisdom that comes from of God. And I can see Daniel being able to share uh, all these prophecies, letting the wise men that he influenced know about there's going to be a coming Messiah, someone who is going to shepherd his flock, be ruler over Israel. And so maybe some of these wise men, like the ones who came and followed the star, maybe they were influenced and, and they were true wise men. Because they were truly seeking the coming of a Messiah. Someone who is going to save them from their sins. So this morning, now you get a picture of what a wise person, a wise man, woman, and child is as you enter into 2016. First, notice their reaction in verse 10. When the wise men saw the star, they were overjoyed. Stop right there. You know, think about that. Overjoyed. Um, on a scale, th there are different levels of joy. Uh, and on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low and 10 being high, um, I would say uh, getting a six-pack of tube socks for Christmas, that's a 1, right? And, and then I would say 
walking out on Christmas Day morning to the driveway and finding one of those uh, uh, new 2016 models with a big red bow on top of it, that's a 10, right? <clears throat> the wise, men, wise men's joy was an 11. We're told they were over. Joy. To the, it's like when you hear news and you just can't believe it. Uh, they were on the border of disbelief, uh, but they couldn't deny it because here they were and they were entering a little room in Bethlehem and they were seeing the newborn king with their very own eyes. And then notice their reaction continued. We're told they bowed down and they worshipped him. They, they worshipped him not just as a political king, but as the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior king. And then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They didn't stop at the dollar store in Jerusalem. They didn't buy cheap plastic gifts that are going to get broken in a couple of days after being played with by a baby. They brought to him gifts that were the best and gifts that would last. So I would ask you, the uh, offerings that you brought to the Christ child this morning, uh, do you come here? And is it just going to be a hastily and hurried buck or two from your purse or from your wallet? Or is it going to reflect your long journey of life and of faith? Will it reflect the God who has generously provided for all of your life? But it's not just talking about treasures. Will you take of your time, uh, the time like those wise men did? They took time off from their careers. They took time off from their busy schedules. They took time off, and will you this coming year, so that you can journey to Bethlehem and be in God's house on a regular basis. But it wasn't just treasures, and it wasn't just time, but it was also of their talents. In order so that you may be of service, not just for yourselves to get you ahead in life, but for the Christ child. And will you make the time in order to hear the truth? The same truth that the wise men had used in order to follow the Christ child. Because they didn't just hear the truth and then, just, and then say, you know, if I really had time, I would, go, I would go over there and follow that star. But man, I got a million things to do. No, they acted on the truth. They took time off from their busy schedules. They went, they followed, they found, and then they worshiped. So what will the wise men offer you as an example to follow? How about, um, what, what will your offerings be? Tarnished by resentment, thinking that uh, you've got just enough um, not to make ends meet? What about uh, mouths here? Mouths that sing God's praises, but then may immediately mutter a judgmental ill will about someone else later? What about, uh, what's your, what are you going to offer your king when it comes to your mind? The king who who made you pure and holy, and yet how often are our minds filled with such dark, oh my word, the, the horrible thoughts and the secrets that we harbor inside that would even make the devil blush. What will we offer with our king in our hands, not just in service to ourselves, but what of those hands that have not shown love in service to others? Or how about my heart? What about my heart that flips, flip-flops faster than the ones that I wear to the beach? A heart that one moment will be worshiping Christ the King, but in the very next moment, I'll, I'll just get distracted and start following another earthly idol. The times that we tell ourselves, you know, um, I can... Uh, I recognize what the temptation is, and, and you can have temptation as long as you don't give in to temptation, right? You can harbor and feel evil and resentment in your heart as long as you don't act upon it. So you can toll the line of temptation as long as you don't cross the line of temptation, right? Well, tell me in 2015, how did that work? And how often, if, that's, if it's true, there's the difference between smarts and wisdom. 
Sinful smarts that, that tell you one thing, but it's not wise, and you know it. And you know how you know it? Because of hearts that oftentimes get filled with guilt and regret for things that we have done. If we are going to be wise, really wise people, heading into a new year, then here's what we have to do. Before you give another offering, before you think another thought, just sit there and just stop and then receive a gift. God's gift to you as you head into 2016, our drum roll, beautiful pair of feet. Listen to this Bible passage. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, and who say, your God reigns. God proclaims good news to you this morning. That though your sins are as scarlet, he's washed them to be as white as snow. God proclaims to you this morning peace. That that separation between you and God that is caused by our guilt and regret for what we have done. That divide no longer exists in spite of who you are. And God brings you good tidings. Great joy, right? Christmas Eve, what is it? That a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And look at the names that, by which he will be called. He is going to be called the mighty, the mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. God's gift to you is a Savior. You, 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 there's nothing this year that you can do to make yourself better. It's simply a gift. He gives you forgiveness. He gives you peace. And someday he will give you heaven. So I say, wise is the person who seeks the gifts that God gives. To those who would just go into this year and see the gifts of God, but treat them with apathy, lukewarmness, lukewarmness, indifference, is then to show yourself to be smart, like a King Herod or teachers of the law. But this is a new year, right? That means the old is gone, the new has come. So may God truly work that marvelous change from darkness to light. Because now you discover what lies in the light of Bethlehem. And with the wisdom that only God can give, may then he lead you to proclaim and to share this new light with others. Because of beautiful feet. God gave them to Gentile Christians. God gives it to you. So there's the difference between smart and to be wise. And it's not gifts given, but gifts of God received. Amen.